Manipulatives are the first and most important pillar in making edu-games, a new type of educational game that merges fun and education. What's a manipulative? First and foremost, a manipulative is an object that you can touch and manipulate with your hands while learning. An example might be this white cube, exactly one centimeter in length. In this case, the manipulative represents the concept of one. That's the second principle of manipulatives. Each one represents a single concept. Finally, you can combine manipulatives together to create new concepts and build your understanding. For example, you can combine two white rods to create the same length as a red rod. At first, manipulatives were physical objects used mostly to teach arithmetic. These colored Cuisinier rods were invented in the 1940s and popularized over the 50s and 60s. Physical manipulatives like these let you easily count and group items, meaning they're almost ideally suited for basic math. So much so that the Wikipedia page for manipulatives actually has the word mathematics in its title. There are lots of physical manipulatives for almost every math topic. In fractions, for example, you can make the fraction two-thirds using fraction circles, or fraction bars, or two-sided counters, or even with a geo board using rectangles of different areas. Physical manipulatives are wonderful for basic math. It's very intuitive to hold an object in your hand and then either count or group those items together. Seymour Papert and the MIT Media Lab did some really innovative work in the 90s creating digital manipulatives, basically adding digital computation to traditional children's toys like Lego blocks, which inspired Lego Mindstorms in the mid-90s. In 1992, Nintendo created an early virtual manipulative with Mario Paint's Music Mode. You could drag and drop Mario sprites onto sheet music, and each one would make a different sound when the music played. Then in 2003, MIT Media Lab created a prototype of their brilliant drag and drop programming language, Scratch. Students could drag and drop code blocks onto their screen to create programs in video games. Over time, more and more educators started using virtual manipulatives in their apps and games. Dragon Box Algebra from We Want to Know came out in 2012 and taught algebra with an iOS app using virtual manipulatives that students could drag and drop across the screen. Endless Alphabet from Originator came out in 2013 and taught the alphabet using virtual manipulatives. Then in 2014, Dragon Box struck again with Dragon Box Elements, teaching geometry by having students do drag and drop Euclidean proofs. It's a brilliant edu game. Dragon Box has definitely made some of the best manipulatives in the business over the last 10 years. In 2017, Triceum launched Variant Limits to teach calculus, starting first with finite and infinite limits. Then in 2018, Playmata launched Collisions to teach chemistry, bringing virtual manipulatives beyond mathematics entirely. Virtual manipulatives have continued to go beyond basic math due to several advantages. First, virtual manipulatives are powerful. You can make virtual manipulatives do all sorts of interactions that would be impossible in the physical world. Look at how Dragon Box Elements let students make a Euclidean proof that this polygon is a square. Also, virtual manipulatives are smart. They can keep track of all sorts of things for you. For example, here, Playmata's Collisions Edu game keeps track of which electrons you've added to the atom and which atomic orbital it was added to and in what order. Finally, virtual manipulatives are cheap. Physical manipulatives can be quite expensive. This set of 74 wooden Cuisinier rods costs around $20. Even a plastic version is $12 a set, but you can give an infinite number of virtual manipulatives to students for free. Of course, you have to build the game first, and students need to have touchscreen devices, but once those are in place, it's very cheap to make additional manipulatives for students to use. So how do you find a virtual manipulative? The first place to look is physical manipulatives. For example, after building edu games to help kids learn algebra and geometry, Dragon Box decided in 2015 to make a numbers edu game to teach kids how to count, add, subtract, and more. Dragon Box Numbers was clearly inspired by the Cuisinier rods we talked about earlier. You can visit Montessori classrooms or high-end toy stores to look for more inspiration. Another place to look is in books. For example, say that you wanted to teach Egyptian hieroglyphics. You could show hieroglyphs for the Pharaoh Ptolemy V, as found in a cartouche on the Rosetta Stone. Each hieroglyph here is used phonetically to spell out the name Ptolemaeus, the Greek pronunciation of Ptolemy. 
You could make each hieroglyph into a manipulative that students could drag and drop on your screen. You can also look to history. For example, abacus were first invented around 2500 BCE. There have been many different types of abacus over the centuries, each of which could be potential inspiration for a math manipulative. Abacus are still in use in China and Japan today, especially in private schools and after school programs. They represent one of the most successful math manipulatives ever, and a powerful source of inspiration today. YouTube is also a good place to look. This YouTuber is using Cuisinaire rods to model grammar structures. You can see in her example that each colored rod corresponds to a different part of speech. Andrew is looking for a house. She then transforms this sentence into a question by reordering the rods. Is Andrew looking for a house? Once you've found your manipulatives, make sure to search for all three modes. In the early 1980s, Singapore started teaching math using three manipulative modes, concrete, pictorial, and abstract. Their approach was based on the psychologist Dr. Jerome Bruner. He called the three modes inactive, iconic, and symbolic. But we'll use Singapore's names as they're a bit more intuitive. Concrete manipulatives are like the colored Cuisinaire rods used in Dragon Box numbers. These are like the physical manipulatives that students can touch and manipulate while learning. Pictorial manipulatives are pictures or drawings used to represent these concrete concepts. Dragon Box Big Numbers, for example, has kids pick apples off of trees and then count them up. The apples here are pictures or drawings that kids can use to solve math problems. In mathematics, abstract symbols are things like numbers and variables. After players get comfortable counting pictures of apples, Dragon Box Big Numbers has them use actual numbers themselves to add and subtract. Math-based manipulatives that rely on counting and grouping will often have all three manipulative modes. Dr. Bruner recommends doing all three modes in order. Once a student can solve a problem using abstract symbols, you can say they fully understand a subject. That said, not every edge of game will have all three modes of manipulatives. Dragon Box Elements does use concrete manipulatives and pictorial ones too. They seem to have avoided the abstract symbols of Euclidean proofs though. Perhaps those were deemed too complicated for younger students. As we apply virtual manipulatives beyond basic math, you won't always find all three modes of manipulatives. Just do your best to find as many as you can. Now that we've found our virtual manipulatives, it's time to build a grammar. A grammar is just the rules that govern how your manipulatives work. Let's look at an example. The collisions edge game for bonding atoms by sharing electrons. How would you build a grammar for this? The first step is research. A good question to ask is, what abstract symbols do people use to solve these problems? When studying these chemical bonds, people usually use Lewis dot structures. Here's one for the oxygen atom. Each dot here represents an electron. Let's see how the collisions edge game puts it together. Here you can see a circular oxygen atom with lots of information packed into it. You can also see these dots representing electrons. And the electrons live in these little areas called domains. These are our manipulative nouns. Let's get started with our first noun, an atom. What can you do to an atom? For starters, you can bond it with another atom. To bond two atoms, you just drag and drop them together. That's our first manipulative verb to bond. What else can you do to an atom? If you try to bond two atoms but the electrons don't overlap, they won't fit together. So we can add a rotate verb so that you can rotate an atom before you bond it to another one. Also, what if you want to unbond two atoms? We can make that a verb too. Another thing, when you get started, you'll need to get the atoms from the top area into your workspace. That's another verb. And finally, when you're done bonding your atoms, we need to check the atoms to see if your answer is correct. So just for our first manipulative noun of atoms, we've identified five verbs, five things that you can do to an atom. Now let's move on to our next manipulative noun, electron domains. What can you do to an electron domain? You can merge them together so that you can fit more electrons inside of them. You can also unmerge electron domains as well, so we can make that a verb too. So for our second manipulative noun, we have two verbs. Finally, we have our last manipulative noun, the electrons themselves. There's only one thing you can do to an electron, transfer the electron between electron domains. 
So that's our only verb for this particular noun, to transfer electrons. So to build a grammar, first we identify our manipulative nouns. In this case, the nouns are the atom, the electron domain, and the electrons. Then, for each noun, we identify all the different things that you can do to that noun. These become our verbs. Once you've identified all of your nouns and then made a list of all of their verbs, your manipulative grammar is complete. Manipulatives are the first and most important pillar in an edu game, but you can't have an edu game without puzzles. My kids have coded dozens of video games using virtual manipulatives inspired by MIT's amazing Scratch programming language. But they learn programming the old-fashioned way, by downloading popular programs, carefully reading the code, and asking their dad for help now and then. In a true edu game, the developer makes carefully designed puzzles for students to solve. By using drag and drop manipulatives to solve the puzzles, the players learn everything they need to know. It's this marriage of manipulatives and puzzles that's at the heart of an edu game. In our next video, we'll take a closer look at these puzzles.